Hi! <laughs> Welcome to Archival Adventures here on VTUL Studios Twitch and Rogan27 Twitch. Uh, it's been two weeks since we had a show, uh, so thank you for, for coming today. Um, before we get started, I have you know, the typical uh, land acknowledgement and uh, labor acknowledgement that I do, although the university has updated the language on this, so I will read the new language for you. Uh, Virginia Tech acknowledges that we live and work on the Tudelo and Monacan people's homeland, and we recognize their continued relationships with their land and waterways. We further acknowledge that legislation and practices like the Morrill Act of 1962 enabled the Commonwealth of Virginia to finance and found Virginia Tech through the forced removal of Native nations from their lands, both locally and in Western territories. We understand that honoring Native peoples without explicit material commitments falls short of our institutional responsibilities. Through sustained, transparent, and meaningful engagement with the Tudelo and Monacan peoples and other Native nations, we commit to changing our, the trajectory of Virginia Tech's history by increasing Indigenous student, staff, and faculty recruitment and retention, diversifying course offerings, and meeting the growing needs of all Virginia tribes and supporting their sovereignty. We must also recognize that enslaved black people generated revenue and resources used to establish Virginia Tech and were prohibited from attending until 1953. Through inclusive VT, the institutional and indiv individual commitment to prosim that I may serve, in the spirit of community, diversity, and excellence, we commit to advancing a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive community. So thank you for uh, <laughs> joining me on the show today. Um, it's nice to have some updated language there, uh, specifically updated language that um, speaks to uh, coming up with specific commitments uh, towards um, making changes in support of greater diversity. Um, so, you know, we'll see. Uh, the it, It's only been a couple of years that Virginia Tech has even done land acknowledgments, and even more recently that they did the slavery acknowledgement. Um, so uh, it's more words. There are different words. Um, I think they're meaningful. I think it's meaningful to make those acknowledgments uh, whenever I'm live, because it's this show is kind of my platform, and I think it's important to do. But um, anyway, today's show, we're looking um, a little more recently, well, no, I mean, Moral Act was 1962, and the materials we're looking at are from 1965 through the 1990s, um, and we're going to be looking at materials, uh, specifically technology manuals. So um, I have brought the Gerard Monsbach collection of technology manuals. Um, I don't know a ton. This collection is one that we were brought in 2019. And they said, do you want this? And I took a glance at it and said, yeah, sure, we'll take this. Um, and it has sat ever since then because we haven't yet had time to physically process it, describe it. So there's no finding aid yet. There's none of that. Um, we do have an inventory of the materials, um, although that inventory is very long. And unless you're really familiar with technology manuals from the 60s and 70s, probably isn't going to be too meaningful to you. But I think it will be fun and interesting to explore. You'll kind of get to see um, a relatively simple collection that is unprocessed. And I did bring a second unprocessed collection as a treat that I'll pull out at some point in time. Uh, and if you're here when that happens, you'll find out why I, I grabbed that one. But um, before we go uh, diving into the collection, I want to read you a little bit about Gerhard Mansbach, the person who collected these materials. I have a note. <laughs> I just have to pull it up, and then, then I can read it to you. Because um, like I said, this, is, this collection is not processed yet, uh, so I don't have a, a nice, easy place to go to read a biographical note that we've researched and done. Um, but when I was accessioning it, um, and if you're not familiar, accessioning is just the process, that's the term we use for bringing in a new collection. Um, when I was bringing it in, 
I did a little bit of biographical research, and so I do have a biographical note that I can read you about Gerhard Monsbach. Um, but before I do that, we have a raid. Uh, welcome, 16-bit Eric. Welcome, Whimsies. Uh, welcome to Archival Adventures. I am uh, Anthony Wright de Hernandez, the Community Collections Archivist here at Virginia Tech. Uh, the Whimsy community likely knows me as Rogan27. Um, welcome, uh, all of you. It's great to have you join. Um, today, we are looking at the Gerhard Monsbach Collection of Technology Manuals from the 1960s to the 1990s, uh, so some early computer stuff. And um, I do have a special collection that I uh, also grabbed. Also, so both of the things that I have today are unprocessed. Um, but uh, I, I have an extra item today in honor of uh, Star Trek Day um, that I will pull out in just a moment. Uh, but welcome in. It's great to have you here. Thank you all for joining. And we will be, um, I was just about to read a little biographical material, uh, material about Gerhard Mansbach, the person who collected the materials we're looking at today. Um, so uh, Gerhard Mansbach, or Jerry, um, was born in Kassel, Germany in December, uh, December of 1928, um, immigrated in 1936 to New York City, um, graduated from high school in New York and then the University of Chicago, becoming a self-taught computer programmer in the 1960s with punch card systems for the Department of Public Works in Boston. Uh, there he produced a data-driven Uni United States Commerce Department of Public Works report, the Cape Cod Tourist Study, measuring the mid-1960s tourism impact on Cape Cod. Uh, Monsbach was employed by the Charles Stark Draper Laboratory at MIT uh, from 1969 until 1980. Um, he programmed guidance systems for the Apollo missions and for General Motors uh, auto body stamping machines uh, for Fiat in Turin, Italy. And after he retired, he created a musical brailler for the vision impaired, a software product for fluid inclusion studies called Overlay Assistant with a spectrometer for Virginia Tech's geology department, and a biosensor monitor monitoring software for biological monitoring incorporated in Blacksburg, Virginia. So um, long history of computer programming, had some computer manuals that he had collected over the years that were donated to us in 2019. Um, and we're going to explore those today. But in honor of Star Trek Day, before we dive into that, I have an acquisition that we picked up in 2016 that I thought you all might find interesting. Um, let me just switch over to the document camera here and see how... So if you're unfamiliar, Star Trek Day is today, September 8th, 55 years ago, Star Trek started. Uh, I believe this is the anniversary of the first episode airing. Uh, do correct me if I'm wrong, because I have been rather busy today and didn't have a chance to actually look up which anniversary it was. I just know it's Star Trek Day. Um, we acquired this item for our special collections in 2016. It is a signed copy of a Star Trek script from Star Trek the original series, uh, signed to Rocco from James Doohan. Um, and I don't want to open it too much because that's going to bend the pages. I, I can try and once one moment. I'm going to do this without bending the pages because I can. Anyway, how is everybody doing today? Also, Laugh and Roses, thank you for the follow. Um, here we go. Star Trek. This is production number 6149-6. Series created by Gene Roddenberry, Desilu Productions, Final Draft, June 16, 1966. This is The Man Trap. Written by George Clayton Johnson. Uh, 
note to director, throughout the script we will see Nancy as various different people. Uh, Crater and McCoy see her the same because both knew the real Nancy. Others see what they want to see or what they expect to see. Nancy's ability to change her appearance is a form of protective camouflage. Just as the chameleon can change its color to blend with its surroundings, so can Nancy change her physical appearance. For clarity so that the audience will be able to follow the transformations as they take place, we suggest you find a highly identifiable pose, gesture, or movement that will be characteristic of Nancy. Possibly seeing her with folded hands, clutched hands back to palm, a sort of hand-washing gesture that is highly individualistic without being stagey. Jean. Yes, I, I wanted the unbent pages, and honestly, when we go to process this, we'll take out, we'll take out these little metal um, pins that were holding it together anyway, so I uh, <laughs> just went ahead and took them out uh, so that I could show this without bending the pages. And so you can see, um, it was signed by James Dewan, highlighted as Officer Scott. So this is definitely uh, James Dewan's copy of the script. Um, so we don't have a ton of like Star Trek memorabilia, um, but this came up uh, at auction and we bought it. Um, I think it's one of two signed Star Trek items that we have in our collection, the other one being a signed copy of uh, George Takei's autobiography from the 1990s. Um, and then if you dig into our newspapers, uh, we have some interesting references to Star Trek. I know there's um, in Alice, which was a local like counterculture newspaper here. There are ads and discussion of Star Trek in there. Um, hi, Hannah. <laughs> also, hi, Chandra. I, I commented on your, your posts, but not didn't say, forgot to say hi to you. Um, so anyway, I thought this would be a neat just thing to pull out. I don't know that we're going to go through the entire thing, uh, but we do have the script here if anybody is interested in that. Um, we got it in 2016 and it has yet to actually be processed. Um, so I had to I had to look up where it was and go and dig it out uh, from the accessions folder or box. Um, eventually it will get processed and just put on the shelf so that people can look it up and come in and just use it. Um, right now you would have to know we have it. But if you came in wanting to see it, you could do so uh, as long as you knew we had it. Um, anyway, Star Trek script. Are there any notes in the margins? Um, I will flip through real quick because I didn't see any. I just saw the note from Jean at the beginning. Yeah, it's just the highlights of uh, it looks like scene directions. I'm just gonna. I'm not even sure. Like it had highlighted. Um, Commander Scott, but, but I don't even know. If his actual lines are highlighted. It's mostly just the scene directions. So this, I'm not sure. I thought this was Scott's, I thought this was Duen's uh, copy because it highlights his name in the cast list. But then again, I haven't found any places where he speaks in, in flipping through. So I can't tell whether, this would be stuff that uh, when we actually go to process it, we would look for those kinds of details. It looks like a directorial, yeah. Um, like in doing the description, I think we would hope to do that. Interestingly, these lines here from Spock and Uhura are highlighted. So 
So yeah, this is, it's a copy of the script. I don't know whose copy it was initially. Um, I had thought maybe Scott or uh, Doohan because that's the name highlighted on the cast list. And that could still be. Um, I don't know who directed this episode, but note to director is highlighted. Uh, anyway, signed by James Doohan, a copy of The Man Trap. Um, but the main collection we're looking at today is also unprocessed. Um, like I said, we got it in 2019, and apart from me looking at it and saying, yes, we're interested, we'd like to have this, uh, haven't really gone through it to see what's there. Um, I can show you kind of what... It's in boxes here. Mark Daniels. And these boxes say alumni cards because these are old boxes that are not actually the collection that's in them because um, I haven't, it hasn't been processed yet. So it doesn't have its own boxes yet. I mean, it does. They're just recycled older boxes. <laughs> So it's possible it could be Mark's script. It's possible it could be an assistant director's script. It's possible it could be many things. Um, in the collection, like accession, we probably have notes to say uh, whatever the auctioneer or the auction house knew about it. Um, unfortunately, I don't believe I have any way to log into that where I am right now. Uh, because getting access to the back end of our database is restricted to certain places, and I would have to remember the link. So anyway, uh, Gerhard Monsbach, uh, Collection of Technology Manuals, um, various things. Right now, I've got a binder here for the BAL assembly language. So. Here is a manual from the IBM Systems Reference Library. Uh, IBM System 360 Degree Operating System Assembler Language. Um, and so this appears to be a publication that he transferred into a three ring binder. Uh, this is from Looks like this is probably 1970 because the copyright information on it is 1966, 68, 69, and 70. So let's see what this is all about. We have a preface. This publication is a reference manual for the programmer using the assembler language and its features. Part one of this publication presents information common to all parts of the language, followed by specific information concerning the symbolic machine instruction codes and the assembler program function provided for the programmer's use. Part two contains a description of the macro language and procedures for its use. Appendix A through J follow part two. Appendices A through F are associated with parts one and two and present each item as a summary chart for contents, instruction, listings, character set representations, and others, uh, other aids to programming. Appendix G contains macro language summary charts, and Appendix H is a sample program. Appendix I is a features comparison chart of System 360 assemblers and J includes samples of macro definitions. Well, I'm interested in seeing um, sorry, I just realized I was in emotes only and subscriber only chat and I apologize for that. Uh, 
I went live and completely forgot to switch those off, and I guess uh, my mods also forgot to switch those off. Uh, <laughs> those are off now if you want to chat. <laughs> Hi was not worth it. Um, I, I don't know. <laughs> I had a lot of things going on when I was getting ready for stream. Uh, if you all have comments on the um, Star Trek uh, script, let me know. I can pull it back out again if you want to point something out to me or something like that. Otherwise, I'm going to continue with the technology manuals. Um, and yeah, I, I have, I need like a post-it note list of like, you should do all of these things when you're starting a stream. But also there are a lot of things that I wish I didn't have to do. Um, I'm interested in this sample program. Appendix H. All right, that's Appendix D, G, H. Appendix H. Sample program. And this is literally going to have an actual program. Um, a lot of like older, in fact, I, I may have some somewhere where I have actual like computer magazines um, that would give you code for a, a program, like just printed in the back of the magazine. But this is a manual, so getting a sample program is not too surprising. Um, so let's see, given a table with 15 entries, each 16 bytes long, having the following format three bytes for the number of items, one byte for the switches, four bytes for the address, and eight bytes for the name, uh, to a list of items each 16 bytes long, having the following format, eight bytes for the name, one byte for the switches, three bytes for the number of items, and four bytes for the address, uh, which appears to be the same number of bytes for the same items, just in a different order. Uh, find any of the items in the list which occur in the table and put the switches number of items, uh, put the switches number of items and address from that list entry into the corresponding table entry. If the list item does not occur in the table, turn on the first bit in the switches byte of the of the list entry. And then the table entries have been sorted by their name. Hi, Fludan. Um, and then it literally is just a sample program, and it is the actual like code for the program. Oh, some of this stuff was still being used when you started IT back in the 80s. Cool. I will appreciate any commentary you want to give. Um, so as I noted, this is from IBM System 360 Operating System Assembler Language is what this manual happens to be. Um, they provide a sample program for a macro definition. And it looks like, honestly, any, any block of computer programming today, it, this could be the general like formatting is, is very familiar if the syntax is not. Uh, but that just happens to be because I don't happen to know this computer programming language. You trained with punch cards in school because they were still in use. Um, so I know Virginia Tech actually uh, was involved in a lawsuit about computers um, back in the 70s. Uh, I know this because my husband um, went to law school and it was referenced in um, his law school class and took note of it because Virginia Tech was where I was working while he was in law school. But uh, basically a student broke into the computer lab and stole time on the computer, um, which ultimately the case ended up not moving forward because at the time there was no law saying that like time using a computer was something you could steal. Um, 
and and the state law changed after that um, to make it so that that would be illegal. Uh, but yeah, apparently time on that computer was expensive and hard to get. Um, and it was definitely a punch card computer. <laughs> um, we definitely had some early computer stuff here. So here again, systems reference library. Um, a lot of these have been rebound by uh, Jerry Monsbach. This is IBM 1401 system summary. Um, this one is from, this is a major revision from September 1964. System concepts. We have card-oriented system. Uh, that might be interesting to look at. Uh, magnetic tape-oriented system, disk storage-oriented system, special features, other input-output units for the IBM 1401 system, IBM 1401 programs, and programming systems. A lot slower, so the time was costly. I think what they ended up, uh, when the case moved forward, I think they determined that they could only charge him for the theft of the electricity uh, because that was the only thing that had been stolen according to the law. Um, and so the theft of the electricity was a couple of like cents because the cost of electricity for the amount of time was, was not great. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, we, we've, we had... A number of different things where Virginia Tech had early systems. Um, we had early computer systems. We had the very first, um, uh, what is it? I've forgotten the word, but basically a, a um, there was a nuclear reactor on campus, but it was a uh, one for learning how to operate nuclear reactors. Um, and it was the very first one ever put in. Uh, it was called an Argonaut. Um, anyway, uh, here we see various models of computer at the time. Um, honestly, fairly small looking. They don't look like they take up an entire room. Let's see what the description of the IBM 1401 system. The IBM 1401 data processing system is designed to provide the transition from punched card data processing equipment to the data processing system and to accommodate subsequent business growth through the various IBM 1401 system configurations. A data processing system consists of functional units to provide data input, data processing, and data output. The IBM 1401 system implements punched card input and output at speeds much faster than punched card data processing equipment. This permits fast and economical data processing in areas where punched card data processing is desirable but not fully efficient using punched card data processing equipment. Magnetic tape and magnetic disk can be used as sources of input data for processing and as devices for storage of output data. Each has its area of use, but both provide storage for large volumes of data for processing. <laughs> Hannah, I'm glad I could help you remember what day it was by, by streaming. It felt really weird going two weeks without, uh, without hopping on to stream for the archives stream. Um, I want to see, card-oriented system, that's what I want to look at. Holidays on Mondays, oh yeah. There was a holiday this Monday too, yeah, here in the U.S. at least. Um, the IBM 1401 card-oriented system is completely transistorized. 
and utilizes the modern technique of stored program control. This system can perform all basic functions such as reading, printing, comparing, adding, subtracting, and editing, and variations of these functions. The IBM 1401 incorporates an advanced design of many outstanding features of existing equipment for improved programming and operating efficiency. Core storage provides instant access to information and the stored program. Every position can accommodate either an alphabetic or numeric character and is individually accessible. Character time is 0. or sorry, uh, 0 0.0115 millisecond. Variable word length permits maximum utilization of the storage facility. High speed printing increases output efficiency. High speed reading and punching offers faster input and output and permit easy and permit easy integration of the 1401 into existing accounting machine procedures. Editing completes the preparation of information for printed output. Huh. You know, I never thought about the fact that punch card machines, you ran through punch cards to run a program. But somewhere, somebody had to punch those cards. And so if you were writing programs, you had to have a machine that would punch the cards. And then you had all the little like chads from the punched cards that could, and there'd be all this dust. And I imagine they were relatively flammable. I don't know, but I can't imagine that like, computer rooms would have been hot and there would have been dust from punching cards and possibly a little chads floating around uh, from the punched cards. They had to have been fire hazards. The IBM 1402 Card Read Punch provides the card-oriented system with simultaneous punched card input and output. This, I'm, I'm down here right now. Um, this unit has two card feeds, one for reading and one for punching. The read section has a rated speed of either 800 cards per minute or 450 cards per minute, depending on the model. Actual card speed realized is governed by the program routine for each particular run. The read feed is equipped with a device for large capacity loading called a file feed. With the file feed device, the read feed can be loaded with as many as 3,000 cards, which reduces operator, main, uh, operator attendance requirements. The 51 column read feed special feature, interchangeable with the standard 80 column feed, allows the processing of stub cards, thus increasing the flexibility of the IBM 1401 data processing system. The cards feed through the read side of the machine nine edge first, face down. I have no idea what that means, nine edge first. Uh, collected in bins and made great confetti for pep rallies. <laughs> this was uh, fluid on this, uh, this book is from 1964. The cards feed through the read side of the machine nine edge first, face down. The feed path is from right to left, passing two sets of brushes. The read check station reads 80 columns of the card to establish a hole count for checking purposes. The read station also reads the 80 columns, provides a hole count, and directs the data into storage. At the end of the card transport path, three stackers are available to receive the cards. The normal read sticker or the normal read stacker is the stacker closest to the read hopper and is used unless the cards are program directed to stackers one or two. The punch station has a related speed of two hundred or a rated speed of two hundred and fifty cards per minute with a card hopper capacity of twenty one hundred cards. The cards feed twelve edge first, face down. I don't know what nine edge and twelve edge mean. <laughs> The feed path is left to right, passing a blank station, a punching station, and a reading station. The punching station consists of 80 punches for recording information. The punch reading station counts all the holes in all 80 columns of the card for punch checking. At the end of the card transport path on the punch side, three stackers are available to receive the cards. The normal punch stacker is used unless the cards are program directed to stacker four or eight. 
this all sounds very dense to me at the moment. I, I don't know that I understand. Uh, with the addition of punch feed read special feature, the source card can be read in the punch side and output data can be punched into the same source card. Oh. <laughs> Chandra, um, <laughs> I will see you later. Thank you for coming by. <laughs> yeah, reading technical manuals is enough to put anybody to sleep, I think. <laughs> I probably don't want you to explain it either. Um, interesting. I just, it's interesting there's, there's, it's a technical manual about the operation, or that part is specifically about the operation of a punch card reader and a punch card puncher, um, which is pretty cool considering that, I mean, I grew up in the early days of the internet and I barely know anything about punch card machines because they were long since gone by the time the early days of the internet started. Um, we have a programmer's guide to debugging. We have IBM operating system linkage editor and loader. Don't know what that means. Uh, I've got IBM System 360 Operating System System Control Blocks. <laughs> You're old, but that's before your time. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing wrong with being old enough to remember this stuff. I, it's just from before my time. Um, and so this was stuff where I was like, hey, you know, our school has been expanding our computer science programs, and it seemed like possibly having some of these older technical manuals to understand what computing used to be like might be useful for students who are studying computer science. They're still all before your time, too. Uh, instruction, instruction timing information. We can dive into some of these if we want to. I'm just looking to see what all we've got at the moment. Uh, input output control system on disk specifications IBM 1401 and 1460. So right now, this section is all IBM stuff. I, know, I happen to know there's not just IBM stuff in here. Uh, IBM 1620 Monitor 1 System Reference Manual. Looks like we've got some more 1401 and 1311 here. System Operation Reference Manual, IBM 1401 Data Processing System and IBM 1460 Data Processing System. <laughs> Let's see here, IBM 1403 printer component description. And this, I've got a student text, I've got many, many manuals here. There's multiple books bound in this one thing. Let's see. I've got some published items here beyond technical manuals as well. IBM shipped these all with the holes already punched. Oh, I didn't know that. You just supplied the binders. That is... I had thought maybe he took the cover off uh, and stuck it in. So it's cool to know. TRS-80 Microcolor Computer System. <laughs> this is from 1982, so we've jumped forward a little bit, but I have a little, uh, let's see. That's interesting. It opens, this appears to be the front? I'm not sure. Uh, this is from Radio Shack. You turn the television set on, select channel three or four, set the antenna switch to computer, Turn the computer on, 
turn any accessory equipment on, and you'll get a message that says Microcolor Basic VR, copyright 1982, Microsoft, OK. VR represents your version and release. The computer is now ready to use. So this was a computer that was intended to connect to a television set, but a special television set that has a computer setting on it. This is a very graphic, like, very, like, this is meant to be like a quick reference card, I think, for how to use your computer. Basic statements, uh, which that doesn't just mean that these are basic statements. Uh, basic is also a computer programming language. Um, and so writing it that way, these should be statements in basic. TRS-80. Hi, DJ Phoenix. <laughs> Yeah, this is basic programming. I, um, I learned Quick Basic in high school. Um, so this is telling you what these different uh, command words will do. Clear n reserves n bytes of string storage space, initializes all variables. C load loads a basic program file from cassette. Um, let's see. Run, as a command word, will run a program. Read, reads a value from a data statement. So, I mean, looking at it today, basic is very basic when it comes to commands. But these are kind of the foundations that computer programming started with. Um, video control codes error messages, the very prominent Radio Shack logo. They used to have a switch you attached to a TV to let you switch from watching TV to using it as a monitor. You could also use the same switch you used to switch to play an old Atari 2600. Um, 2600 was my first gaming system. Operators, functions, control keys. Radio Shack, the biggest name in little computers. Let's see. So that's a quick little reference card, not exactly a manual, but it's in this collection here. What do we have here? Um, this is for a program called Picture Power. The Power of Pictures, the first integrated software system for incorporating pictures into databases. Which, like most of the internet, would not function today without pictures in databases. <laughs> Commodore 64. Uh, Picture Power from Pictureware Incorporated is an integrated software system. Yeah, we read that. Now available with True Color. Oh, look at this. Do you see the. I, I don't know how easily you can see the picture there. I can try and focus on it. Just, it's a very, like that is a DOS interface. Um, I cannot imagine how long it would have taken to load that picture of that building. <laughs> You're of the age that you could have had an Atari, but you didn't start gaming until much later. Your first gaming system was a PS4. However, you also remember playing on an old computer that could handle word processing and Oregon Trail. Uh, I definitely played Oregon Trail in elementary school. Um, they had copies of it on our library computers. 
which was the only place that had computers. And they were primarily for, I don't know what they were primarily for, because we used the card catalog to look things up. I think they were primarily for exposure to computers. Um, I remember playing Oregon Trail. I remember that they had a little like extra thing that was attached to the monitor to give it a touch screen, which was absolutely fascinating in the 1980s. Uh, real estate and properties. Color shows your properties at their best. Picture power gives instant access to what your clients want to see. Real world color pictures for museums and galleries. So this um, reminds me of, like there are a lot of, uh, there's a database product called Past Perfect, um, and that kind of reminds me of it, although it was definitely newer than this. Uh, security and identification. A picture database provides a secure, up-to-date means for positive identification. That looks like a still, I don't know if you can see it very well, that looks like something we would have seen on Murder, She Wrote, as like a computer output on Murder, She Wrote. When is this from? I mean, this is all stuff that we do without even thinking about today. And this is showing you, hey, look at this brand new thing that we just figured out how to do. Um, wouldn't this be great for your company to be able to do this? And and today, this is like, if a system doesn't do this, you're like, why would we even consider you? Operates under the standard IBM PC DOS for the PC, XT, AT, and co compatibles. Requires 512 kil uh, kilobytes of memory. Computer is interfaced to a standard TV camera by a digitizer board. Images are displayed via a display board either on a standard TV monitor or on an IBM color monitor with an adapter. But there's no date on this anywhere, so I don't know exactly when this brochure is from. I have an owner's manual here for a 12-inch data display which is basically a television. The Amdeck Model Video 300. It features a high resolution display, non-glare display screen, low power consumption, 120, 220 vo volts, interchangeable power transformer, light and compact, easy to carry. See what we know about this thing. I don't know mid 80s for the picture power. I don't know of any computer maker today or computer component maker, because this is, this is for a monitor who would include a schematic diagram of the board. But here is a schematic diagram of the control board for the Amdeck Video 300. that is included in this user manual. We have a power indicator, power on brightness, contrast, video input jack, AC cord with plug, horizontal hold, vertical size, vertical linear, vertical hold, 
directions. Multiple cautions against moisture. Huh. All right, let's see what else we got. So many IBM technical manuals in here. And they all look the same. They're kind of interesting, but hang on one second. I have to put some of this stuff back because I don't want to lose the order. I don't know that the order in this case is going to be very informative, but you never know. And our goal is to keep the order as much as we possibly can. So let me just put some of these back in the box real quick. <laughs> Okay. Woo. Let's see what else we have here. Another more for that IBM fourteen oh one autocoder on disk. IBM 1231, 1232 optical mark page readers. I do not know what those are. Let's see if there's a short description. 1963, optical mark page reader. During the past several years, many changes and advances have been made in the field of data processing. Computer access times have diminished from many milliseconds to a few microseconds. Printing speeds have risen from 100 lines a minute to well over 1,000 lines a minute. Programming systems have become problem-oriented, easier, and cheaper to use. Although these significant advances have taken place in the processing and output areas of data processing, no significant improvements have been made in the methods by which source data is recorded and entered into these systems. The IBM 1231 and 1232 optical mark page readers represent a breakthrough in the area of source recording and data entry. They provide a facility for recording the data at its source in a form that can be converted directly into data processing language. The IBM optical mark page readers read positional marks made by an ordinary lead pencil on, a pap on paper documents. The positional marks are converted into a machine usable form by the 1231 and entered directly into a data processing system, or the marks are read and the information punched into cards by the 1232. Okay, you know what this sounds like to me? Um, this sounds like a Scantron machine. <laughs> as kids would know them, as anybody who took standardized tests in school would know them. This, the, the process just described there sounds like what a Scantron machine does. Uh, reads pencil marks on a page. Um, I do not know, and this is probably, I mean, this is, it's probably the same fundamental technology. I don't think this is an actual Scantron machine, but you think you're glad your job doesn't need computers. Computers are nice to keep track of your sales and bookkeeping, but your actual job doesn't require computers and has been relatively unchanged for 50 plus years. Um, my job requires computers. <laughs> uh, everything we do uses computers. Sometimes it would be like it would be nice to not have them. All right, I I'm, I'm getting things out of order. Let me put them in order. There. But archives definitely require computers because um 
so much of everything that's done today is only done on computers. And so we have to be able to archive that stuff too, not just things from the 1800s uh, or before. Let's see, uh, Massachusetts Co Computer Associates Incorporated, a description and definition of simple ambit G, a graphical programming language by Aust D. Austin Henderson, Jr. The author is currently a graduate student at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Project MAC, Cambridge, Massachusetts. April 28, 1969. The work reported in this paper was supported in part by the Advanced Research Projects Agency, which is ARPA. So grant funded. Technically, you could do most of your job without electricity, but it's easier with it. Let's see, what do we have? This paper describes an algorithmic language entitled Ambit G, Algebraic Manipulation by Identity Transformation Graphical. This language is two-dimensional in nature. Data is taken from a certain class of directed graphs, and its statements are subgraphs with alterations to be made. This language has been found in invaluable as a formal tool in the development and specification of algorithms. It has proved so useful to researchers in several diverse fields that the author deems it worthy of attention to the general computing community. The simple language described here was created by Carlos Christensen at Compass, this language has been extended by a number of its users in different ways. These extensions are as yet too new to be stable and so will not be discussed here. The paper consists of two descriptions of simple ambit G. The first is in English and is quite informal. The second is in mathematical notation and constitutes a formal definition of the language. Let's see, an ambit G program is composed of a set of shapes a date graph, a set of program statements, and a control structure. The control structure designates flow of control amongst the program statements. The database and all the program statements are defined in terms of the shape set. I'm not sure. So this is programming to manipulate graphs, it seems. But student work from when uh, Mansbach was at MIT, presumably doing instruction. Um, program logic. An introduction to the IBM 360 operating system. <clears throat> Let's see. So this is from, this is a reprint dated 1972. We have a lovely image in the beginning. We have a computer. And I'm referring in this case to the large machine and not to the woman, um, although Honestly, not too long before this, the word computer would have referred to the woman. Um, that's the IBM System 360 Model 65. Uh, it looks like we have tape drives on it. Uh, you can see over here we've got um, magnetic tape readers. Uh, it looks like there's a card punch system or a card reader system here in front of the tape drives, though, um, <clears throat> which would have been the input-output method. Uh, the card punch would have been 
input output. The tape drive would have been storage. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what the typewriter machine that the woman is sitting at, uh, how that interacts with the computer. Let's see. Operating systems. This part gives background information on operating systems in general, describing their purpose and how they evolved. If you are, are already familiar with operating systems, go to part two, the IBM System 360 operating system. So when I looked at this collection and was like, yes, we will take it, um, the items in it are not, it's a printer. OK, thank you, was not worth it. Um, the items within are not um, particularly rare. These were not hard to find. There are copies of them in various places. But most of those copies are in like regular library collections. Um, by accessioning them to a special collections or into an archives, um, we're saying these are worth preserving. And as these disappear from library collections, less and less of them will be around. And we'll have a copy, because it's part of our archives here. Um, and while these machines may no longer exist, and we may know, like nobody needs truly to know how they operate, this kind of information is useful for studying computer history and understanding early programming and things like that, which is kind of the intent behind why we were interested in having them. So let's see. Uh, when computers were introduced several years ago, several years ago, like today it'd be like, when computers first arrived decades ago, um, or nearly a century ago, when computers were introduced several years ago, they were usually put to work on jobs that had required a great deal of routine human activity. Basic accounting, record keeping, and problem solving were a few of these early applications. Figure one. Uh, by and large, the automatic processing of such jobs proved the speed, economy, and reliability of electronic data processing. And so look at figure one. Before, we have a human at a table with a pencil, bookkeep bookkeeping system, pencil and paper, accounting with key-driven machines. Uh, note, bookkeeping, the um, illustration of the person, rounded head uh, indicating close-cropped hair, the accounting with key-driven machines, the hairstyle is different, and it is very clear. So just the silhouettes being given, bookkeeping is a male silhouette, and accounting is a female silhouette. And then we have scientific problem solving with desk calculator, also a male silhouette. And then we get punched card accounting, where we've got the computer system and a female silhouette again. Um, I just, I, I find that interesting. Accounting is apparently women's work uh, at this, it, it, in, in the past. I don't know. When did I mention electronic data processing? Because if you want me to go back to it, I'm happy to. I just don't know where it was. <laughs> oh, uh, electronic data processing. There's a mention of it here. It was the name of the program that you took in the 80s. So I don't know that I saw a specific like manual called that. There was a reference, or it says, um, it mentions the speed, economy, and reliability of electronic data processing. Oh, gotcha, just the reference. 
Yeah, uh, that's how computers were thought of. They were not personal. Yeah, this is not a personal computer. This is definitely a work machine. This is for accounting, bookkeeping. It's uh, to replace repetitive human work. Uh, and that's, I mean, the very first pr pr paragraph here was, um, yeah, IBM changed that in the 80s. I have, um, honestly, I think IBM started to change it in the 70s because um, we have an Osborne one that I believe is from 1981 uh, that was starting to take the personal computer and make it a portable personal computer. Uh, let me double check the date on that. Um, Oh, I should limit that search to just us because uh, 1982, yeah, the our Osborne One microcomputers from 1982. So even by the early 80s, they were starting to take personal computers or. Well, no, I guess it was still a business machine at that point in time. Um, but they were starting to move into uh, essentially early laptops by the early 80s. So who knows? Uh, I, I, would have to do, I would have to do research to figure out when the transition started. Um, and there are definitely places that have that history. There's the Computer History Museum up in uh, Massachusetts. Still 80s, more the size of a toaster oven. Yeah. Um, so the, the Osborne one specifically, which I know a lot about because I processed that for our collection, um, it's the size of a portable sewing machine. If you've ever had a portable sewing machine um, that kind of has a case uh, that has like a lid that comes off of it, that is the size that the Osborne one is. It's 14 pounds. Um, and it was supposed to revolutionize work, it's essentially an early, early laptop. Um, and due to mismanagement and early announcement of upcoming models when they weren't ready to come out, uh, they tanked the company. Uh, they tried to tease an early model, or they tried to tease an upcoming model that was going to be better than the one they were currently selling. Um, and they did it too far in advance, and it killed all of their existing sales, and that put the company under. Um, but it's pretty cool, uh, although the size of the screen on this portable computer um, was about the same size as a modern cell, cell phone. <laughs> it feels very tiny compared to the large size that the actual device is. Um, I may show it off on stream sometime, but it would be like a, a bonus, kind of like what the Star Trek script was today. I it's not something where I have enough experience uh, or would have enough to show to give a full like two hour stream on it. Because um, I don't know the CPM2 uh, operating system well enough to really do much on the computer. Um, and I don't really have any programs to run on it. But I have, a, I have one. Um, Let's see, later computers entered a more challenging phase of development in which the industry began to devise system applications, applications that go far beyond the mere mechanization of manual operations. Management information systems, process control systems, medical diagnos diagnosis systems, computer-assisted instruction systems, and information retrieval systems are a few recent examples. Today, as a result of this rapid progress, sorry, on Star Trek Day, I just have to mention the phrase rapid progress. Uh, see Star Trek The Next Generation, Episode 1, Encounter at Farpoint. Note uh, John Delancey's portrayal of Q, and you will hear the phrase rapid progress. Um, <laughs> and I lost my place with that. Uh, 
Today, as a result of this rapid progress, most data processing installations are facing an increase in the number of conventional applications, as well as an increase in the scope and complexity of large-scale systems applications. To cope with these problems, the data processing system must efficiently apply all of its resources, hardware resources, information resources, and human resources. <laughs> Oh, hi, Key Squared! <laughs> you were dismantling out-of-date technology, so you missed the discussion of out-of-date technology. Uh, we still have a little time, and we've barely scratched the surface. I'm going to move on from some of this IBM stuff, because um, we have a lot of these. And I want to look at some of the other stuff that's in here, because IBM is not the only thing in here. Um, Let's see. I've got a Honeywell manual. Reliable software systems. I know I have some old Apple stuff in here that might be interesting to look at. Um, and then I have some examples of some of the programming that this, that uh, Monsbach actually did. Do, do, do. One moment. I know I'm basically off screen. Oh. There we go. Close that box up. <laughs> um, let's see what's in the second box here. Okay. What is this? This is from Motorola, May of 1990. EVB, EVM, EVS application note, third-party software vendors. Third-party software listing that identifies vendors who support Motorola's family devices via assemblers, debuggers, etc. Now, so this is 1990. Was Motorola always a cellular device company, or is this referencing something else? I don't know. We have a couple of these things here from Motorola. And I have no idea if these are all going to be related to cell phones, or if Motorola did other things before cell phones. Motorola Freeware Electronic Bulletin Board. Freeware is the name of the Electronic Bulletin Board System, BBS, dedicated to the support of Motorola microprocessor units. Huh. So I, it does look like Motorola, just based on this, um, made chips before cell phones. Uh, and microcontroller units. Freeware is an on, is online 24 hours a day, every day, except for system maintenance. Following is a sample of the available freeware topics. 8, 16, and 32-bit MCUs and MPUs, evaluation boards, evaluation modules. So this is an online support system that would be like uh, a manufacturer would have like a help and a, like you could search help and see frequently asked questions, things like that. Um, this was what that was back in the 90s, was a bulletin board system that you dialed into with a telephone, uh, like through a, a telephone modem. You learned basic 1-1. One, one. Uh, we were talking about basic earlier because we had um, an item that had some basic on it. Uh, I learned Quick Basic, so, and that was in high school in the mid '90s. Uh, some more stuff: Motorola semiconductors. Let's see. This one, um, I really don't know a whole lot about what's in this collection. I've looked, I've thumbed through it before, but haven't really looked at any of this stuff, and nobody has. 
because uh, this is all unprocessed. Percom internal diskette drives for the IBM personal computer. Copyright 1982, Percom Data Company. Limited warranty. Trademark ownership. IBM personal computer with Percom drives installed. This manual provides the information required to install and check out Percom internal diskette drives for the IBM personal computer. When is this from? 1982? So from early, like 72 we were still having manuals talking about punch cards and now we've got an item telling you how to install internal five and a quarter floppy drives. Um, so within 10 years. And honestly, 10 years later, it was three and a half floppies. And 10 years after that, CDs. And 10 years after that, no discs at all. Uh, IBM System 370, OS VS2, Release 2, still, there, so there's a lot of IBM manuals here. These were li likely replacement larger capacity drives than the original PC. Oh yeah, uh, I forgot about cassettes, Fluden. Um, we do have a Commodore 64 that has a cassette drive. Uh, at present, it does not function. And my, my computer hardware expertise is so small that I'm unable to determine the problem myself. The fuse is fine. Uh, with some Googling and researching, I had thought maybe the power supply was the problem. We got a new power supply for the Commodore 64, um, and it still wouldn't power up. So some component somewhere uh, on the board is likely dead, and I don't know how to troubleshoot which one it is. Um, I also don't have the equipment or expertise to desolder it and solder on a new component so we can get it working again. But if we ever get an uh, actual like Commodore 64, we have the monitor and the printer and software and the cassette drive and other th stuff like that um, in our collection. Uh, it's just right now we don't have any way to fully assess what's there because we can't turn it on. Um, but look at these. The guide to what's where in the apple, and what's where in the apple. Uh, so these are both by William Luber. And one is a complete guide to the apple computer, and one is an atlas to the apple computer. Um, so not all IBM. Uh, this is from... August of 1981, it looks like. This is written by William Luber, adjunct professor of engineering, Dartmouth College, Hanover, New Hampshire. Just double checking the date. Yep, 1981. Some acknowledgments. Contents, introduction and user manual. So how much do you know about early Apple computers? Oh, this is about the Apple II. The Apple II contains an address space of over 65,000 locations. Many areas of this space are shared by the user, the monitor, the DOS, and high-level languages. It is possible to write interesting and useful programs without regard to how the Apple memory space is used and managed. In fact, this is exactly how most basic and machine language programs are written. 
Yet a simple knowledge of how Apple's memory is organized can simplify the task of writing most programs and can help produce a more compact and efficient code. Located, or locked within the Apple are many permanently resident routines which can accomplish many common tasks. Most of these routines remain largely undocumented and thus are difficult for the average Apple owner to use. While information is available here and there about some of those routines, there has been, up to now, no one reference source containing documentation on all these routines. The Atlas and Gazetteer, which follow, contain this information and more. Let's see. Some basics on Apple memory organization. Using a monitor routine from AppleSoft. Creating a machine language program from AppleSoft. Oh, I haven't heard AppleSoft in a long time. Apple ASCII 2 representation, zero page usage, logical organization of text display area. Atlas. Woo! Address range of Apple II. RAM address range of Apple II not in. It's literally like locations and labels. I. What? I don't honestly know how useful this is, but then again, I don't, I know a little programming. I don't know what specific, how specifically useful this is to have just a listing of locations. It's a guide for hacking your 2E, yeah. The whole book is just a list of locations. I'm just going to uh, flip through. Monitor memory location until we get to. So that was the at atlas. And then we just have other works. Interesting. Whoa. I apologize. I bumped the camera and it went flying. It's usually taped down with blue masking tape, which it is not presently attached to the table. Um, mapping the memory locations and what is, yeah. Yeah, I just, I don't know how useful that is personally. Um, I don't know that it's information I've ever had a need to know. Here we have the Programmer's Guide, Programmer's Atlas, and Programmer's Gazetteer. Hardware and firmware. The world of system-specific programming. Basic doesn't have to be a straitjacket. Neither does assembly language. <clears throat> you can read and write to the address space with your programs. This was before the operating system protected itself from that type of activity. Uh, so, like virus code. OK. So knowing the location, you would, it would help you to write the program to specifically put information to the specific places that you wanted to put it. Huh. You could change how the operating system worked. Interesting. 
So these books are literally how to hack your system. But at the time, like, it was just how to make your system do what you want your system to do. Uh, and today it would be <laughs> how to hack your system. Interesting. They have really pretty covers. <laughs> Which I know is not, like, the most important thing, but also... I would need to study a bit before I understood uh, exactly what these books were giving me. But as reference for people studying old computers or studying computer programming generally, I think they might be interesting or useful. Um, here I have uh, file folders. These file folders are for Overlay Assistant, which was um, Overlay Assistant was a software that Jerry Monsbach wrote for fluid inclusion studies. Uh, using the spectrometer for Virginia Tech's geology department. Um, so in these folders is stuff about a program that he actually wrote. And as you open it, I have disks. So part of processing this collection will be using our FRED, uh, Forensic Recovery of Data Device, um, Uh, and actually making digital backups of these if there's anything recoverable on them. Because um, we are well past the actual functional life of a five and a quarter disk or of a floppy, or three, three and a half floppy. Um, technically speaking, even though all of the CD companies sold them as good for 100 years, we're past the actual functional life of CDs as well. Uh, if they've been around for longer than 10 to 20 years, there's a good likelihood that there is data degradation on uh, CDs as well. Um, so when we process, we'll want to get the information off of those disks. Ooh, Hannah, have fun helping with that custom piece. And I will see you later. Overlay Assistant User's Manual. Preliminary uh, February 24th, 1994. Issued February 25th, 1994. Command line parameters provide settings for program runtime parameters that require... permits the user to raise the bottom line from the lowest screen position to 200 lines above that position. This feature is included to overcome overscanning of older monitors. Lens set permits you to user to store the scales for commonly used objective lens. I don't know. Uh, this is for some sort of scanning device. Uh, so the user manual has stuff about calibration, screen display, editing, etc. Looks like we have a couple of copies of the user's manual. Let's see what else do we have. I don't know and haven't dug through enough to know. Um, so I know that he did some programming for the Apollo missions. I don't know if any of that information is in here or not. What's funny is, even if it's not, we probably have some of his programming because we have uh, 
a lot of the programming from the Apollo missions because we have multiple collections dealing with the Apollo missions. Um, so more overlay assistant, which is what I expected, but just is this just more user manuals? I don't know the difference. That's some of the analysis that we'll need to do as we're processing, is to figure out what's different about these two file folders so that we can describe that for people coming to take a look at things. Uh, directory of Fluid Inclusion Researchers and Laboratories. So this is what this program is about, is fluid inclusion analysis. Working group on inclusions in minerals. Commission on Ore Forming Fluids and In Inclusions. This was work that he did for the, the um, overlay analysis or overlay assistant program was something he did after retiring uh, for Virginia Tech's geology department. This folder is called Promotion. Oh, one second. Huh. Well, I will be careful. I was not expecting to need gloves today. I guess these are prints of what this program outputs. Huh. Just not going to touch them too much. I maybe would have flipped through them a little more meticulously, but here's, here's one that's not on photo paper. Uh, water vapor in a Creed Sphalerite. Um, my cotton gloves did not make it onto the cart, so I don't want to touch the, pho the photographs. Because um, I don't want to get uh, skin oils all over the photographs today. And that is just not good for photo paper. So this is some sales flyers, it looks like. Let's see what else we have. Lots and lots of those sales flyers. How about we look at one and actually look at it instead of flipping through thinking that we're looking for something more interesting because it's all interesting. Introducing Overlay Assistant, a new software product for fluid inclusionists. For professionals using a fluid ink heating and cooling system with a Doric temperature indicator, a new screen overlay system permits detailed documentation of inclusion measurements. Overlay Assistant is software custom designed for fluid inclusion studies and is currently in use by Dr. Robert J. Bodnar, Virginia Tech Fluids Research Laboratory. Now you can put all your information in a single screen, overlay pointers, text, and scales for any lens system on the dynamic screen image and capture the entire video record while viewing. Note these features, text boxes, subscripts for chemical symbols, fast, easy editing, multiple color pointers, continuous temperature readout, time, date information, movable adjustable scales, magnification indicator, sample identification, menu-driven selections. Send for demo disk and close $3 US or $5 outside US. 
system requirements, PCAT with a mouse. If anybody knows, I do not know what the abbreviation AT means there. Uh, I know PC is personal computer. I don't know what AT is. Um, digital in-out board with a cable and video overlay board. Huh. So they'll send a demo disc for $3. The software itself costs $439. Interesting. Got some correspondence. We'll look at that one in a second. I have to show this off because I think this is absolutely amazing. I had never seen anything like it before. Here's a file folder, a hanging file folder. AT is advanced technology. So this hanging file folder, the front of it has a sleeve to hold four five and a quarter floppy disks. I had no idea these were a thing. I have had never seen a hanging file folder with slots for floppies before. <laughs> it's not something I had ever encountered. It's like a, so the AT is like a model number for which version of PC operating system or this is for something called DOS Talks. Um, wow. Transparencies. for an overhead projector. They're actually not in bad shape. I've seen much worse. More the hardware generation. Gotcha. So I'm not sure what DOS Talks is. This is one where uh, it'll take some wrapping my head around it. My guess is DOS Talks is going to be another program. Why it's in the middle of the overlay assistant file folders, I don't know. I suspect that it just got mixed in there by mistake. It could be a class or lecture. That is also a possibility. Um, and then I have a, another hanging file folder, but this is, doesn't have the folder part. It is literally just a sleeve that can hold six three and a half inch floppy disks. Uh, and on it, I have four disks all labeled, all labeled overlay assistant backup. So don't know. Those are ones where we'll have to load up the Fred and see if there's anything that we can get off of them. Um. <laughs> Hi, Wraith. Oh, did you see the, um, Wraith, did you see the five and a quarter floppy uh, hanging file folder? <laughs> I ha no, not in this collection. I have not seen an eight inch floppy uh, file folder here. And this collection also didn't have any punch cards, although there are manuals for punch card machines. <laughs> I think we have some punch cards somewhere in our collections. I'm, I'm not 100% certain though. Um, ooh. Polaroid, perfect data. Remember when Polaroid sold discs? So this is, um, <laughs> <laughs> hey, 
Hey, I remember when Polaroid sold discs. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with remembering that. Um, so this folder is Overlay Assistant Technical. Um, and I, I wanted to show this because I used this for the tweet uh, about today's show. This is one of the pages in here. There's not really a lot of context. There are other pages. Um, I have an 8-inch floppy reader downstairs. I mean, we have a lot of disk drives because we have a FRED machine, um, which FRED stands for Forensic Recovery of Evidence Device. Uh, it is a system that allows for the forensic recovery of data. Um, it's sold to a lot of like uh, law enforcement agencies for the purposes of accessing data on uh, digital devices without writing to them. Like it won't even log that it's been accessed. Um, so it is a method, it, it allows um, reading devices without writing to them at all. Um, and it's also useful for archival work, where we want to collect things, including all of the context metadata about the last time they were accessed and things like that, without ever writing anything to them. Um, so we have that. Um, but anyway, uh, so this is in the Overlay Assistant Technical. Um, and honestly, I don't know for certain what this graph paper is. I don't have a lot of context for what is going on here, but my guess is that this graph paper is part of him designing what the user interface for this software was going to look like. And on this graph paper, we've got various cursors mapped out, um, but also, like, so we've got these various arrows that to me look like cursors. And we have some targets. Uh, I think this is, I, yes, I do think it's mapping out the number of pixels. Um, this was software that he wrote. Uh, and this is early 90s. So I think that this is him mapping out pixel by pixel what the user interface elements were graphically going to look like. Um, and I just found that interesting. I thought it was one of the more visually interesting things in the collection that wasn't like a published user manual or tech manual. Um, so I pulled it out and scanned it and used it as the, the tweet for this collection. Um. So I don't know if any of you know this, Whew. but I have a whole box here. Let's see how I want to show this. Paradox by Borland. I don't know if anybody's familiar with it. It appears to be a database software. I'm not certain, though. It's not something that I'm familiar with. But we have the user's guide, so hopefully that can tell us. Also, oh, you're unfortunately familiar with Paradox? <laughs> um, you won't be able to see it, but I can see where somebody has written stuff while they were, while the paper was sitting on top of this. And there's indentations of like numbers and calculations on the cover of this book. Um, relation, Paradox Relational Database version 3.5. Um, I do have some expertise in relational databases, but uh, mainly using SQL. Um, this software product, copyright 1985 and 1990, 
Incidentally, if anybody <coughs> is ever looking to have fun with relational databases, or if you want to learn about the basics of relational databases, I recommend picking up a copy of the Manga Guide to Databases. <laughs> it is a manga that teaches you about how relational databases work. Uh, and I, I recommended it to some people in library school who were struggling in the database class um, to wrap their minds around how databases worked, and they found it helpful. Um, so the Manga Guide to, do, to Databases, I do recommend for people who are learning the basics of how databases work. This was Borland's attempt to capture some of the DBase markets, marketplace. Gotcha. Welcome to the Paradox User's Guide. This book is a comprehensive guide to Paradox, a fast, full-featured, and easy-to-use relational database management program designed to meet all of your information management needs. This manual is primarily a reference guide for intermediate users. Most of the manual is arranged according to the co commands in the main menu. If you are new to Paradox, you should first read the Introduction to Paradox manual and work through the tutorial examples there. For an overview of the capabilities of Paradox, see Chapter 1 of the Introduction to Paradox, a companion volume to this book. For detailed information about designing forms, reports, and graphs, see present Presenting Paradox Data. Interesting. So in this collection, I have the Paradox User's Guide. I have the Introduction. I have the Presenting Data. I have Personal Programmer's Guide. I have Network Administrator's Guide. And I have the PAL TM User's Guide. Um, and also, I'm guessing in this box will be the actual program. Yep. I have diskettes, Paradox, Intermediate Database Power, PAL Quick Reference Guide. Let's try and open this up. Commands, oh gosh, check plus, clear all, clear image, close printer, co-edit, array, backspace, ditto, do it does big these are all the key uh the functional terms for the database otherwise called syntax yes thank you words uh sorry i'm i i i heard the groan was not worth it uh when i brought this up and you said unfortunately like, I could feel that, but at the same time, I find this super exciting because I love databases. <laughs> like, I, I did a, before I went to library school, mm -hmm. I um, managed and administered a database for about a decade before going to library school. Uh, and taught myself SQL while doing it because um, I had no training. Uh, <laughs> so coming across a database software like this to me is rather exciting. Ooh, that's Paradox. Oh. We have the Cape Cod Tourist Study that I mentioned at the top of stream. Um, this was, um, so Mansbach, while uh, let's see, while he worked, he was a self-taught computer programmer in the 1960s with punch card systems for the Department of Public Works in Boston. There, he produced a data-driven United States Commerce Department of Public Works report, Cape Cod Tourist Study. So this is that report. Um, uh, 
Commonwealth of Massachusetts, Department of Public Works. Results of a study of tourist travel on Cape Cod. During the month of August 1963, the Department of Public Works conducted a roadside survey on the approaches to Cape Cod to determine the impact of motor travel on the Cape. Survey was scheduled for the peak period of tourist travel to provide the broadest possible sample of tourist practices and interests. A national function of the department to undertake such a, a natural function of the department to undertake such a study. So this is just a report on that study. Some graphs. Sorry, uh, I didn't even look at this when we assessed this collection to determine if we wanted to take it. Um, this is spectacular. Uh, so we took this collection partly because the overlay assistant program that we were looking at, he wrote for the Department of Geology here at Virginia Tech partly because he um, did programming for a local company uh, called Biological Monitoring Incorporated. Uh, so for those reasons. Also, um, he did programming for the Apollo missions, and we have a number of collections related to the Apollo missions. Um, I did not in any way consider this Department of Public Works for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts study in assessing this collection for possibly taking it. Um, but Virginia Tech has the Virginia Tech Transportation Institute. And this, while being a study of the impacts of traffic on the on Cape Cod um, has information in it about how they prepared drivers for the fact that a study was going on ahead they were going to be driving over a sensor etc cetera, etc cetera. that is all really cool historical information that would be of relevance to the Virginia Tech Transportation Institute uh, <laughs> so it's like a gem in the, in the middle of the collection that I didn't even know was there that could be useful for one of our areas uh, that we support by gathering materials. So I just find that really cool. Can, can you imagine a sobriety checkpoint like survey today? Um, no, I probably can't imagine that, but uh, I that was an unexpected surprise in the collection, which I get because, like I said, this is all unprocessed material. I don't know what's in here. I'm opening it up, looking to see what there is. Um, Boston IBM seed disk contents. I don't know what this is. Personal computer users group seed disk number two, mini abstracts. This program reads and sets the date stored in your Hayes chronographer or chronograph, requires basic language and a chronograph connected to a serial communications port configured. So the, the first page, the page before this was, here are some files for you to play with. Some will need modification for you to run on a 40 column display. I think this is like exercise work for learning how to use or practicing a programming language. I'm not certain though. Boston IBM users group. Oh, we've got, I don't know if you can hear it. Um, the ink ha is sticking these two pages together. 
Um, a lot of printer ink, uh, if it gets heated, um, it has moisture in it, and it will actually stick to other pages. So as you can see, um, you can see where the ink from the front of this page has actually transferred some onto the back of this page. That is probably the most telling thing that it was a different time. They probably drove away thinking how cool it was to participate. Yes! They did probably drive away thinking it was really cool to participate in that survey. Here we have um, a diskette holder in the three ring binder. I just, these to me are some of the more interesting, like a lot of people today, it, it, we will end up keeping these, but not necessarily because they are, like we won't necessarily keep them for the information on them because we'll, harvest that information and move it into a more stable uh, preservation format. Um, but we'll still keep the disks because as objects, they themselves are of interest, especially to college students of today who a lot of them have never seen a three and a half inch floppy, let alone a five and a quarter inch floppy. In fact, some of the students today have never seen a CD. Huh. These are OK. <laughs> I've been having fun. I hope you all have been having fun. Um, we are at the end of our time for this week. Uh, or a Laserdisc. Yeah, absolutely. People have not seen Laserdiscs. Um, unfortunately, I cannot really run long today. I have a class to teach in about an hour. Um, so I do need to go and set up for that class. Uh, but thank you all for joining me today and taking a look at this uh, collection. Um, I knew it existed. I didn't know what was in it. Uh, hopefully you found something interesting about the collection today. Um, next week, uh, the plan is to try and feature a number of different items uh, that show off different styles of handwriting throughout the years. Um, so hopefully I can find those within our collection. We don't really catalog things by what type of handwriting they have. Uh, so I will endeavor to find samples of various different kinds of handwriting. So who knows what the contents will be, but it'll be fun to find out and hopefully you will join me. Um, I will be live again for Archival Adventures next Wednesday at 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time on twitch.tv slash VTUL Studios and twitch.tv slash Rogan27. Um, again, thank you all for coming. Um, <laughs> You got almost nothing done at work. Was not worth it. Um, hopefully it was worth it. Uh, we will be raiding. Um, and I believe it'll be the Monterey Bay Aquarium if they're still live. Uh, they are. So I'm going to go ahead and set that up. It looks like it is the jellyfish cam today. So um, just a note for you there in case you are not comfortable with jellyfish. Uh, just so you know what you're getting into, I'm going to go ahead and set up that raid on both channels and we will head over there. Um, and yeah, I will see you again next time. Thank you all for stopping by for Archival Adventures and have a good rest of your afternoon.